Hi there, my name is What is Moo, and welcome to part two of my Soviet Army field guide. I'm calling this part Protected Mobility. This is a loose term I'm using to encompass armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles, airborne self-propelled guns, and reconnaissance vehicles. The bulk of this video is spent on the BTR, BMP, BMD, BRDM, and MTLB. While we tend to think of these as referring to families of vehicles, this isn't quite true. BTR is the Russian language acronym for Armored Personnel Carrier, BMP stands for Infantry Fighting Vehicle, BMD means Airborne Fighting Vehicle, BRDM means Combat Reconnaissance Vehicle, and MTLB means Lightly Armored Multipurpose Tracked Prime Mover. This doesn't always correspond to their role. For example, MTLB has often been used as an armored personnel carrier, while the BTR series has several generations of unrelated wheeled and tracked vehicles spanning the entire post-war era. Minor variants will not be examined in particular depth. There are innumerable variants of these chassis that serve the myriad roles of the Soviet Army and Warsaw Pact. While it's a neat party trick, for certain kinds of parties, to identify which command variants have what radio by their antenna fitment, the distinction is rather academic. This series is an introductory guide, not an exhaustive resource for the anorak-wearing expert. This series, again, is focused on the practical identification of meaningful differences. Last video I explained this by saying my goal was to tell you which tanks need a law and which tanks need a tow, not how many millimeters of whatever material their armor arrays are made out of. Well, everything in this video, thankfully, will die to the basic M72 law or equivalent. Continuing our methods, however, armor discussion will still be qualitative, not quantitative. I didn't get a C-plus in pre-calc in 2014 to be doing trigonometry for YouTube videos. What I will tell you is the rough effectiveness of armor and anti-armor weapons on the basis of firing trials, procurement specifications, or combat experience. Think less X millimeters at Y degrees or Z hundred millimeters of penetration, and more, this armor will stop small arms in 50 cal, or this missile will probably knock out such and such tanks. This video will also predominantly describe vehicles by role, not mechanical lineage. Therefore, while BRDM-2 will be discussed in this video, the SA-9 Gaskin or 9K-31 Strela-1 will be in Part 4, Anti-Aircraft and Anti-Tank Systems. Furthermore, the wonderful, if puzzling, menagerie of post-Soviet modernizations, ad hoc field modifications, and other esoteric variants will not be covered. There simply isn't enough time until the heat death of the universe. Because of the ubiquity of Soviet weaponry fitments to vehicles, I'm going to give a quick overview of the weapons we'll be discussing today before launching into the vehicles themselves. First is the SG-43 and derivatives. Goryunov's machine gun is available in a ground mount, the SGM, a tank mount, the SGMT, and a spade-gripped flex mount, the SGMB. It is a 7.62 by 54 mm general purpose machine gun with a rate of fire between 6 and 700 rounds per minute cyclic, and an effective range of approximately one kilometer. The follow-on was the PK series, Kalashnikov's machine gun. It is commonly seen in the infantry mount, the PK, PKM, and PKS, the tank mount, the PKT, and the flex mount, which sometimes has spade grips, the PKB. It is a 7.62 by 54 millimeter machine gun with a rate of fire of 650 rounds a minute or 750 rounds a minute for the PKT, and an effective range of 1,000 meters the Czechoslovakian equivalent to the PK series is Fural's universal machine gun, the UK-59. The Czechoslovakian UK-59 is a 7.62 by 54 mm machine gun. Analogous to the Pulamet Kalashnikova, it has an effective range of about 1,000 meters and a rate of fire of around 750 rounds a minute. Moving up in caliber, we have the venerable Dushka, the Degtyaryarov Spagen high caliber machine gun. This fires the 12.7 by 108 mm cartridge. It fires around 600 rounds a minute out to a range of about 2 kilometers and is very equivalent to the caliber 50 Browning machine gun M2. Its larger, albeit unrelated, brother is Vladimirov's high caliber machine gun, the KPV series. This is a 14.5 by 114 mm heavy machine gun, most commonly seen as the KPVT. The KPVT fires at 600 rounds per minute and is effective against light armor and soft skins out to a range of about 2 kilometers. Moving once again up in caliber, we have the 30 mm dual rate cannon. This is the Gryazev and Shapunov 2A42. It is 30 by 165 mm and has an adjustable fire rate between 200 and 5 to 800 rounds a minute. 
the Soviet 30 millimeter armored piercing ammunition has an effective maximum range of 2,000 meters, whereas the high explosive shells self-destruct 10 to 15 seconds after firing at 4 kilometers. Soviet 30 millimeter armor piercing ammunition as issued consisted of the 3 UBR-6 armor piercing tracer round. This is effective against lightly armored vehicles such as M113, M551 Sheridan, and LAV-25, but will not defeat the armor of the M2A2 Bradley, which is specifically armored against it in the frontal arc. A subcaliber Sabo was developed in the post-Soviet era, which greatly increases anti-armor performance. Gryazev and Shapunov's successor to the 30mm 2A42 is the 30mm 2A72. It differs mainly in being quite a bit lighter, as well as having a fixed 350 round per minute fire rate. Moving up once again, we have the 57mm CH or CH-51 anti-tank gun. This is a derivative of the World War II era 57mm anti-tank gun model 1942 ZIS-2, the CH-51 is a semi-automatic breech 57mm 73 caliber rifled anti-tank gun. It is present mainly in two variants, one with a long many-ported muzzle brake and one with a simple two-port muzzle brake. The CHIF-51 was easily able to kill Panther and Tiger-1 frontally at ranges out to 500 meters and Sherman passed a kilometer, but it would struggle against post-war tanks like Centurion and Patton frontally. Effective aimed fire was 7 to 10 rounds per minute. Its replacement was the 85mm 2A15 anti-tank gun. The 85mm 2A15 anti-tank gun is a semi-automatic rifled anti-tank gun with an effective range of 1200 meters and a rate of fire of 6 to 7 rounds a minute. The ammunition can defeat light armor and should be viable at combat ranges against NATO tanks of the 1960s, but I've had a devil of a time finding solid information on its gun performance. The 73mm smoothbore light gun, or Sealand's 2A28 Grom, meaning Thunder, is a closed breech sibling of the SPG-9 which was developed for use on the BMP-1. It fires high explosive anti-tank and later high explosive fragmentation to an effective aimed range of 5 to 800 meters, but in theory a maximum range of 1600 meters. More on the issues with this gun later. The rate of fire is around 10 rounds a minute, and the heat shell can reliably defeat steel-armored NATO tanks like Leopard, Patton, Chieftain, and AMX-30. The T-21 recoilless rifle is a Czechoslovakian 82mm recoilless gun with an effective range of 300 meters against moving and 600 meters against stationary targets. It is broadly similar in performance to early Carl Gustav or the M67 90mm recoilless rifle, but is quite a bit heavier. Moving finally to the largest caliber gun we will be discussing today, we have the 2A70 rifled gun. This is a very lightweight, high explosive chucker and missile launcher firing the same HE frag and missiles as the D10 series 100mm rifle on a far reduced charge. The high explosive fragmentation can be fired at a rate of 10 to 12 rounds per minute, while the rate of fire with the gun launched missiles is only 2 to 3 rounds per minute. The high explosive shells come in point and proximity detonation flavors, and the 100mm 2A70 gun is sighted out to 4 kilometers. Now, we're going to quickly cover the various relevant Soviet anti-tank missiles as well. The first ATGM we'll discuss today is the 9M14 Malyutka, meaning baby. The NATO name is AT3 Sager. The initial version of this is Manual Command Line of Sight, or MCLOS, M-C-L-O-S, meaning you have a little joystick and there's a flare in the missile and you use the joystick to fly it to the target like a remote control plane. This was updated to Seiklos, semi-active command line of sight, or the missile steers itself to the crosshairs, in the very late 1960s. Several variants were made, all with penetration able to defeat the NATO steel-armored main battle tanks, but later upgrades such as M60A1 ERA or Chieftain Stillbrew, as well as the NATO box tanks are all armored against Sager. Sager entered service in 1963 and was produced in the USSR until 1984, with a minimum range of 500 meters and a maximum range of 3,000 meters. The flight time is 26 seconds to maximum range. The 9K111 complex with 9M111 missile, Russian name, Russian word with unfortunate homophone in English that means bassoon, or AT4 spigot to NATO, and 9K111-1 complex with 9M113 missile, Russian name Concourse, or competition, NATO name AT5 spandrel, are Seiklos ATGMs. Both were introduced in 1970 and feature user-friendly semi-active command line of sight guidance and more powerful warheads capable of reliably defeating all NATO armor when introduced. The warheads would struggle against NATO box tanks frontally, but they were introduced 10 years after the Spigot and Spandrel came into service. 
Spigot has a range of 75 to 2,000 meters with a flight time to maximum range of 11 seconds, while Spantrel has a range of 75 to 4,000 meters with a maximum flight time of 20 seconds. The final relevant anti-tank missile for today is the 9M117 or AT-10 Stabber AT-12 Swinger gun-launched anti-tank guided missile. This was covered last episode and features mediocre to marginal effectiveness against the frontal armor of NATO box tanks, a range of 100 to 4,000 meters, and a maximum flight time of about 12 seconds. It is a laser beam riding missile, so more countermeasure resistant than Cyclos, but in terms of user and target interaction, it is basically the same. The first slate of vehicles we're going to discuss today are the BTR. BTR, or BTR in Russian, is short for Bronetransporter, or Armored Transporter. This term is equivalent to armored personnel carrier in English. The lineage of the BTR in Soviet service stems broadly from the RKKA's pre-war armored car tank and artillery tractor developments, which included the D-14 armored personnel carrier, BA-22 armored ambulance, and TR-1 and TR-4 armored personnel carriers. Further development included wartime experimentation with modifications to the BA-64 and ZIS-42 chassis, neither of which were produced in large numbers. The bulk of Soviet experience with BTR during the Great Patriotic War was through Lend-Leased Equipment. The USSR received over 1,100 American pattern half-tracks during the Great Patriotic War, alongside 2,500 Universal Carriers and over 3,000 M3 Scout cars. Unfortunately for half-track enthusiasts the world over, the Soviets appear to have altogether abandoned the concept in military use after the B-3 half-track armored personnel carrier, a kit-bashed ZIS-5 truck and T-70 light tank, made an especially poor showing in 1944 trials. There were some post-war Soviet civilian half-tracks, but these mainly consisted of add-on track axles to put on a standard truck. The first post-war Soviet BTR to enter service was the BTR-40. It was a relatively simple 4x4 armored truck, a follow-on and improvement to the M3 Scout car. It was armored against armor-piercing rifle fire at 100 meters, with two crew, up to eight dismounts, and a roof pintle for rifle-caliber machine guns. The dismounts exit through a pair of rear doors and are provided with firing ports on the sides of the vehicle. Mass production began in 1950, with about 8,500 units produced. The BTR-40 was widely exported throughout the Soviet-aligned world, used by all members of the Warsaw Pact as well as China, Yugoslavia, and communist states in Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Americas. The initial production version of the BTR-40 was open-topped, though a canvas weather cover was often available. It had mountings for up to three Goryunov machine guns and was not amphibious. From 1951, a portion of BTR-40 production was made with the ZTPU-2 14.5mm large-caliber machine gun anti-aircraft twin mount. In 1958, the Soviet Union introduced a closed-roof modification of the BTR-40, with a low-armored roof with two pairs of hatches that opened outwards. This came after a number of casualties during the Soviet invasion of Hungary from Hungarians on the upper floors of buildings, aggressively informing the Soviets they were not welcome in Budapest straight through the open roofs of their BTRs. The BTR-40 was also produced starting in 1958 as a nuclear biological chemical reconnaissance vehicle. It was a modification of the standard BTR-40 with dosimeters and chemical analysis equipment, as well as flags to mark contamination boundaries. It appears, however, to still have been open-topped, which is certainly a bold choice for such a vehicle, but some people just need to feel the sunshine on their face and the wind in their hair. Even if that sunshine is some instant sunshine from a cannon, the wind is the crushing blast of a nuclear explosion. Introduced alongside the BTR-40 was the BTR-152. This is a 6x6 armored personnel carrier. It shares the same layout as the BTR-40, with two crew at the front and dismounts to the rear, though it could carry a staggering 15 dismounts, who exited over the side or through the rear doors. It was not amphibious, and was armored against caliber 50 ball from the front and caliber 30 rifle fire from the sides. The main distinguishing feature between BTR-152 and BTR-40 is that BTR-152 is a 6x6 and 40 is a 4x4. A good way to remember which is which, I find, is that 152mm is 6 inches, is 6x6, and 40 has a 4, so that's the 4x4. Around 15,000 BTR-152s were produced, and it was very widely exported. It served notably during the Arab-Israeli Wars and the 1956 and 1968 Soviet invasions of Hungary and Czechoslovakia. 
There are a huge number of local modifications to the BTR-152, but the main Soviet ones are as follows. The original 1950 model year BTR-152 had an open top mounting a Goryunov machine gun with a two-man crew and anywhere from 12 to 15 dismounts. It looks a lot like a US World War II half-track without the track half, so that's a good hint. Alongside the base model Cabriolet, a Roadster version was made starting in the first model year called the BTR-152 ZTPU-2. Around 1,000 BTR-152 were made, which replaced the single Goryunov machine gun with the ZTPU-2 14.5x114mm high-caliber machine gun twin anti-aircraft mount. Even with two 14.5mm machine guns on a ring mount and copious amounts of ammunition, the BTR-152 ZTPU-2 still seats eight dismounts. Limited numbers of quad mount vehicles were produced, but it appears to have still been a prototype. The BTR-152S, or BTR-152 Command Variant, or the, as I like to call it, BTR-152 camper van, was produced between 1955 and 1959, around 272 vehicles were made, and it is a notably taller command variant. It's visually distinctive enough that I don't feel like I have to give any special recognition cues, being that it looks like a BTR-152 had carnal relations with a Volkswagen camper van with the roof up, but it is unarmed. The final BTR-152 variant we'll discuss today is the BTR-152 closed top. After a number of BTRs burned like candles in the 1956 invasion of Hungary, the Soviets put a roof on the BTR-152. It's not a pretty roof, or especially an armored roof, but it will keep out hand grenades and Molotov cocktails, and that's all it was really meant to do. The dismounts were reduced to a meager 13 motor riflemen. Introduced in 1954, the BTR-50 is an all-tracked amphibious armored personnel carrier on the basis of the PT-76 amphibious light tank which we discussed last episode. Over 6,000 were made alongside production in Czechoslovakia as the OT-62. The Red Chinese made a similar vehicle, the Type 77, but it's actually a convergent evolution on the basis of their Type 63 amphibious light tank, so not closely related. Various fittings of machine gun and cannon have been improvised by end users, but we will discuss the main Soviet and Czechoslovakian production variants here. The BTR-50P, or open top, was the first BTR-50 to enter service. It was introduced in 1952, carrying a shocking 20 dismounts, with a two-man crew, a commander and driver, as well as a Goryunov machine gun. Later, this Goryunov machine gun was replaced with a Kalashnikov machine gun. It could both tow and porte artillery pieces, and apparently fire them while portayed. It was lightly armored, and from 1954 was equipped with a ring-mounted 14.5mm KPV machine gun above the commander's seat. Starting in the late 1950s, the BTR-50 was produced and retrofitted with a closed roof known as the BTR-50PK. Dismounts moved through top hatches, and it was typically armed with a single Goryunov or Kalashnikov machine gun. The command variants of the BTR-50PK have two frontal towers and some more radio antennas. From 1955, a BTR-50 open top was produced with the ZPU-2 14.5mm twin mount. At least one quad mount vehicle was also produced, but again this appears to have been a prototype. The Czechoslovakians produced the OT-62, a derivative of the BTR-50 which is broadly similar to the closed roof variants of the BTR-50, though it has two frontal towers like the command BTR-50s. However, they look different. The production began in 1962 with 890 made. It also has side hatches for dismounting and a somewhat more powerful engine. The meaningful distinction is negligible, save the colorful fitment of the T-21 recoilless rifle and machine guns on OT-62 turrets, a readily apparent indication of a Czechoslovakian vehicle. Moving back to wheelie boys, the BTR-60 set the standard for further Soviet BTRs. The first production model of the BTR-60 was the BTR-60P. This is an 8x8 armored amphibious armored personnel carrier with an open top. It carries 14 dismounts and two crew, and was armed with a Goryunov machine gun with spade grips and about 2,000 rounds of 7.62x54mm ammunition. The initial open-topped BTR-60 began production in, funnily enough, 1960 at the Gorky plant in Nizhny Novgorod. By 1987, at least 25,000 BTR-60 of all variants had been produced. Protection was rated to 50 caliber ball frontally and 7.62mm rifle fire around all sides. Following the Soviet Army's experiences in Budapest, where Hungarians had developed this stressful habit of throwing Molotov cocktails, hand grenades, and rifle and machine gun fire, into the open roofs of Soviet BTR, it was proposed to develop a specialized urban combat modification of the BTR-60. 
1960 to 61, Khrushchev pushed a slate of military reforms, central to which was the primacy of nuclear weapons to modern combat. As a result, the closed-top urban combat proposal was modified for greater NBC protection than both the original urban warfare prototype and especially the open-topped production model. This was designated the BTR-60PA and became the standard production model in 1963. It also replaced the Goryunov machine gun with a Kalashnikov machine gun and reduced the number of dismounts to 10 while improving the drivetrain. They dismounted through two roof hatches and were equipped with no less than six firing ports for the dismounts. The driver and vehicle commander each had their own overhead hatch, and the BTR-60PA was only armored against small arms. In 1965, production began of an upgraded BTR-60 series vehicle. Differentiated by the conical turret towards the front of the vehicle, this version became the definitive image of a Soviet BTR. BTR-60PB forms the majority of BTR-60 production, and is so much more common that it is usually what people mean when they say BTR-60 or even BTR. It also means that it is next to impossible to find footage of the open-top or turretless BTR-60 variants. The BTR-60PB added the mildly armored turret and reintroduced the side hatches. The main armament has swapped from a pintle-mounted Kalashnikov's machine gun with spade grips to a turreted 14.5mm KPVT machine gun and a coaxial tank model of the Kalashnikov machine gun. The dismounts further decreased to 8 with one manning the turret and a crew of driver and commander at the vehicle front. The elevation and depression angles of the hand-cranked main armament were 30 degrees up and 5 degrees down. Several command variants of the BTR-60 were made, mostly differing in their radio fitment. They can be distinguished by the generator boxes and antennas on top. Common ones include the bed frame type antenna, the big mast type antenna, or both, as well as the little tiny aircraft control tower variant. The BTR-60 also comes in artillery commander variants. The 1V18-1 and 1V19 are artillery command vehicles with unarmed sensor-equipped turrets. They entered production in 1975 and differ in radio fitment, but this isn't visible from the outside. They're both able to call on the Red God of War, so probably a good priority to poke some holes in. The final BTR-60 variant we'll discuss here, though there is no end to BTR-60 variants, is the MTP-2 Armored Recovery Vehicle. The MTP-2 is an armored recovery vehicle variant of the BTR-60 that lacks a turret but has an A-frame crane mounted to the front. This is relatively easy to identify by the fact that it is a BTR-60 with a crane. Though successful, the BTR-60PB was an imperfect design with mediocre lower hull armor and lackluster engine power, as well as less than ideal dismount doors. In the early 1970s, the Soviets began working on a successor by way of a wheeled infantry fighting vehicle prototype, the Gaz-50. This would eventually take the form of the BTR-70, the overall design of the vehicle remained broadly similar, though the trim vane for swimming was moved from the bottom of the bow to the top, and the lower hull armor was improved and engine power increased. The vehicle was also lengthened, and dismount doors were moved to the lower sides between the second and third axle. The original BTR-70 had a crew of three seven dismounts and the same 14.5 and 7.62mm turret as the BTR-60PB. It was overall superior to the BTR-60PB, though after the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, a high angle of fire turret was desired to engage aircraft. It entered production in 1976. In the 1980s, a high angle of fire turret was introduced that allowed the 14.5 and 7.62mm coaxial machine gun to elevate to 60 degrees above horizontal. This is the same turret later seen on the BTR-80. The main distinguishing feature is the single periscope on the port side of the turret not present on the low angle of fire turret, though this is hard to see, they look pretty similar and perform about the same. BTR-70 was also produced in a command variant which had the bed frame type antenna, although variants with other antennas were produced. Like all command variants, if you see many or big antennas, you probably want to shoot it. The 1L29 or SPR2 or TUT B, meaning Mercury B, is a Soviet proximity artillery fuse jammer which jams radar proximity fuse artillery shells. It's got a big antenna on a stick and it looks wild. It was introduced in 1985 and the system has since been moved to the MTLB chassis, which we will discuss later. So, I haven't brought it up because it's really not that important, but the BTR 60 and 70 have a funky dual petrol engine arrangement. The BTR-80 replaces this with a more powerful single diesel engine. It also adds the previously mentioned high angle of fire turret. 
This entered production in 1984 and brought with it some nice improvements for the quality of life for the crew. The new, more sane engine arrangement streamlined maintenance and the switch to a more spacious door design, which also offered a modicum of protection for disembarking infantry, was welcomed. It is still in production with somewhere over 5,000 examples made. The base model BTR-80 was introduced in 1986, a standard pattern 8x8 wheeled amphibious armored personnel carrier that improves on the desirable qualities of the previous BTR-60 and 70 series and fixes some of their flaws. The main tactical technical characteristics which are improved are the high angle of fire turret now up to 60 degrees and better door design. The BTR-80 looks very similar to the BTR-70, the main distinguishing features being the forward angled firing ports on the side, the different door, the firing port for the vehicle commander pointing forwards, and the new turret. This is not very easy to see, but thankfully it's not actually too meaningfully different in performance from BTR-70. The 8x8 wheeled BTRs are all relatively similar. The BTR-80 also came in command variant, the BTR-80K. This is distinguished by an additional three whip antennas on the hull, and it is one of the more subtle of the command variants in the BTR series. In the late 1980s, though, the Soviets saw battlefield ranges increasing, with the proliferation of 25 and 30mm cannons in NATO ground vehicles as well as increases in armor, they felt that the 145 by 114 mm KPVT was getting a little long in the tooth. The BTR-80A swaps the venerable KPVT-PKT turret for one armed with the new 30 mm lightweight 2A72 cannon and, again, a coaxial PKT. The logistical simplification of eliminating the 14.5 mm cartridge was also beneficial. Other than the increase in firepower, it is largely similar to the standard BTR-80. This brings us to the MTLB series. The MTLB was initially designed in the late 1950s and introduced in the 1960s. Its name means Light Multipurpose Armored Tractor Transporter, and it was designed by the Kharkov plant named after Sergo Orjonikidze, which is different from the Kharkov plant named after Malyshev, whose rather inspired engineering choices we discussed in some detail in Part 1, Tanks. Over 55,000 MTLB series vehicles have been produced by the Soviet Union and Poland. It is sometimes said to be a derivative of the PT-76 light tank, but it doesn't appear to share a mechanical lineage. The initial production version was the MTLB, or MTLBeshka. This is a lightly armored amphibious gun tractor, prime mover, and armored personnel carrier, which was initially used as the gun tractor for the 100mm T-10 smoothbore anti-tank gun. From these humble beginnings, it became widely used as an armored personnel carrier, and the chassis was adapted to support a number of other systems, which will be discussed in other videos. It is armed with a little gun turret housing a Kalashnikov machine gun at the front. The two-man crew consists of a driver and commander, with cargo space for up to 10 dismounts, an 82mm mortar, or 100mm anti-tank gun crew and ammunition. The vehicle is equipped with two roof hatches forwards and two rear doors. It's armored against small arms and maybe 50 caliber ball, it's not designed as a frontline combat vehicle. The MTLB is a reliable go-anywhere vehicle, but it was found to struggle in marsh, swamp, and arctic terrain. To fix this, a wide-track variant was introduced, known as the MTLB-V. V, for all you wearaboos out there, stands for Ostketten. It saw widespread service in the Arctic as well as export to Finland and other countries. With a ground pressure of only 3.8 pounds per square inch, or 0.27 kilograms of force per centimeter squared, just over half that of the infamously light in its shoes CVRT, it really can zip along on basically any terrain. The other notable variant of the MTLB is the RKHM-1. The RKHM is a heavily modified NBC reconnaissance variant of the MTLB. Its silhouette is changed with the raised superstructure, but it retains the 7.62mm Kalashnikov machine gun turret. Visual ID is through the marker flag shooting apparatus at the rear and the distinct sloping bow and tall superstructure. Note, the marker flag machines on Soviet vehicles are not simply gravity dropping in them into the ground, they're firing the flags down with a powder charge. In the late 1960s, the Soviets found that while the MTLB was an excellent chassis, they wanted one suited more towards mounting large equipment such as radars or electronics. The Kharkov or Jonikidze factory stepped back up with an MTLB that had been stretched by just over 800 millimeters or two and a half feet and heightened by eight inches or 200 millimeters. Like the MTLB, it's a lightly armored amphibious utility vehicle, though it has a different profile and an extra road wheel. It lacks the defensive machine gun fitting as well. 
It is still exclusively armored against small arms and is often seen with large electronic gizmos or sensor turrets on the roof. Production began in the early 1970s with over 5,000 produced. The Airborne, not wanting to feel left out, developed their own transporter tractor, the GTMU. Produced from 1974 to 85, it is a fully track-laying, airdroppable, lightly armored transporter tractor, as well as BTR. It is poorly covered in the literature, but is armored against small arms. It was amphibious, propelled in the water by its tracks, and is unarmed. The crew consists of two, a driver and commander at the vehicle front, with an aft passenger compartment accessed by two rear doors, containing up to ten dismounts. It is the airborne MTLB equivalent. The variants include the RKHM-2. The RKHM-2 is similar to the RKHM-1, but on the GTMU chassis and with less substantial modification to the superstructure. The most notable recognition feature is, as always with chemical reconnaissance vehicles, the lane marker flags to the rear. Another variant of the GTMU is the SPR-1. The SPR-1 is similar to the SPR-2, but it's on the GTMU chassis and it's older. It is still an artillery fuse jammer, though this time it looks like a GTMU that has sprouted some old satellite TV antennas on the roof. Moving swiftly onwards, we come to the BMP. BMP, BMP, or Boevaya Machine Pechote, means Fighting Vehicle of the Infantry. It's synonymous with the English term infantry fighting vehicle. The Soviet concept of BMP came as a result of those previously mentioned Khrushchev reforms emphasizing nuclear war fighting. The Soviets planned on fighting on a flaming, heavily contaminated battlefield where the crushing shock of an atomic blast would be a commonplace occurrence. To maneuver effectively on this battlefield and fight, Soviet infantry needed a sturdy, amphibious NBC-protected vehicle. The Soviet army required this vehicle to be at least as maneuverable and of similar range to its tanks, and to be armed to defeat enemy tanks while allowing the dismounts to fire their weapons from under armor and NBC protection. A competition was held with proposals ranging from the interesting, the previously mentioned Gaz-50, to the inspired, shall we say, but the winner was the Object 765 made by the Chelyabinsk Tractor Factory. It entered service in 1965 as BMP. Retroactively, it became BMP-1, especially when BMP-2 entered service, and in total about 40,000 would be produced between 1965 and 1983, with licensed production in Czechoslovakia, Romania, and India, as well as unlicensed production in Red China. Iran produces a derivative that appears to be from the Chinese copy, but the licensing arrangement or lack thereof between either Iran and Russia or China is unknown. The first BMP-1 variant was known to NATO as BMP-M1966. They're always a little slow on the take-up. We can call it the BMP-1 Snubnose. It is a full-tracked, lightly armored, amphibious infantry fighting vehicle mounting the 73mm rocket-assisted smoothbore gun, the AT-3B Sager B manual command line of sight anti-tank missile, and a coaxial Kalashnikov machine gun. The crew consists of a driver mechanic, a commander of both dismounts and vehicle situated in the hull behind the driver, a gunner in the turret, and six dismounts. The gun is in theory powerful enough to knock out NATO MBTs of the day, firing more or less the same ammo as the SPG-9, but it's known to be quite inaccurate. The practical range of the 73mm gun takes a nosedive at or past 500 meters, especially in crosswinds. The round tends to shuttlecock or weather vane, blowing downwind out to about 800 meters, before it turns into the wind as the wind pushes on the fins and crosses back over the line of aim at around 1,300 meters. Incidentally, the BMP-1 73mm gun was auto-loaded, and there's a note in the manual for the gunner to be careful. Don't stick your hand or your sleeve between the auto-loading mechanism and the breech so it doesn't get stuck. This appears to be the source of much of the wailing and gnashing of teeth in the West on the subject of monstrous Soviet arm-eating auto-loaders. The phenomena of Soviet autoloaders mangling their crews is not well documented in the historical record. There's no generation of armless BMP-1 gunners, Soviet or otherwise. The BMP-1's autoloader wasn't as safe as later Soviet autoloaders, which were encased in shields, but it is not some kind of maniacal Saw movie torture device. In any case, though, the autoloader was removed by the mid to late 1970s. There's no gun computer to compensate for the 73mm round's unusual flight characteristics, but given the 500m dead zone of Sager B, the crappy range of the gun isn't a huge problem. Even by manual command line of sight standards, Sager has a deserved reputation for being hard to fly due to the peculiarities of how the control inputs register on the missile. 
Normal missiles and other aircraft, when the operator pushes the stick to the left, the missile turns to the left. When the operator recenters the stick, the missile goes back to flying straight. The Soviets looked at this and thought, Pa, what capitalist decadence, what bourgeois aspirationalism. We can't have that in our good communist missile. And so when on Sagar you push the stick to the left, the missile turns left. And then when you recenter it, the missile keeps turning left. And then you have to push the stick to the right, the equal amount to how far left you pushed it, so that the missile is flying straight again. Or, more likely, flying slightly not straight because you didn't push the control stick the same amount. This is, let's say, counterintuitive. As mentioned previously, neither gun nor missile system are stabilized because the requirements didn't call for them to be. However, the missile sight is through the top of the turret, so you can, in theory, fire the missile from turret down positions. The original snub-nosed BMP-1 was built from 1966 to 1969. Dismounts exit through the two rear doors and are provided with no less than six firing ports. Additionally, they can fire their personal weapons or shoulder-fired anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles through the two roof hatches. Stowage is provided for up to two man pads, such as SA-7 Grail, or one spare RPG-7 anti-tank grenade launcher. Propulsion in the water is from the motion of the tracks, with ducting to assist this on the rear of the track guards, and a trim vane or wave deflector on the bow. The BMP-1 is armored against 23mm armor-piercing incendiary tracer cannon fire frontally from 500 meters range, and 762 by 54 mm armor-piercing rifle fire from the sides and rear. The frontal 120-degree arc is impervious to caliber 50 armor-piercing machine gun fire. Suffice it to say that BMP-1 is armored against non-APDS or non-APFSDS light autocannon fire up to about 20 mm from the front, but the sides will only resist caliber 50 armor-piercing M2 at over 400 meters from direct side. This isn't exceedingly well armored, but it does mean that generally the infantry facing it will need to pull out anti-tank weapons to kill it. In 1969, the Soviets introduced a longer nose version of the BMP-1. This improves handling in the water at the cost of a moderate frontal blind spot for the driver and was known to NATO as the BMP M1970. By the mid-1970s, AT-3 Sagar C with semi-active command line of sight guidance was installed, which reduces the dead zone of the missile from 500 to 400 meters, while the autoloader was removed. Honestly though, the C-close and M-close equipped Sagar BMPs look very similar, as do the short and long noses, it's only about an 8 inch difference. Their tactical technical characteristics are much of a muchness in my opinion. Both are BMP-1s with Sagars. Between 1979 and 1983, new production BMP-1 and those sent in for refit were refitted for the AT-5 Spandrel. The missile launcher was mounted on a pintle on the turret roof. Though the gunner had to turn out to fire, this was a huge improvement to the tactical technical characteristics of the vehicle, as it essentially eliminated the ATGM dead zone. This is good because the 73mm gun was still bad at hitting things, and really bad at killing the new generation of NATO armor that was beginning to enter service in the 1980s. During the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan, a request came up for an up-armor kit for the BMP. When fitted to the BMP-1, this is known as the BMP-1D. It sometimes lost the missile, but definitely lost the ability to swim, and was now noticeably more bulletproof. The distinguishing features are the longer side skirts and the more visible firing port holes. It's kind of hard to distinguish at range from a normal BMP-1, but it's also still vulnerable to an M72 law or anything more powerful. The up armor skirts are only for high caliber machine gun fire. The BMP-1 and BMP-1P both had command variants with an extra antenna on the hull roof. Beyond that, the BMP-1 KSH, Command and Staff, was introduced in 1976 for, funnily enough, commanders and staffs at the regiment, brigade, and divisional level. The BMP-1 KSH is recognized by the different turret without armament instead of having a big extendable radio mast. Being lightly armored, unarmed, and full of important and probably not very combat-ready officers, this is a good vehicle to remember how to identify, since it's an important target. The rule of thumb, though, remains constant. The more or bigger antennas on a vehicle, the more important it is. These vehicles, by the way, save BMP-1D, are all still amphibious. The BMP-1 also came in armored recovery vehicle flavor, the BREM-2. The BREM-2 ditches the turret for a crane and has no fixed armament mounted. It's reasonably distinctive since it's a BMP with a big crane on top, and it has some welding equipment and other repair supplies in the back. Don't expect it to be rough and raring for combat. 
The final main production BMP-1 variant we're going to discuss right now is the MLI-84. This is one of a long series of minor Romanian modifications to Soviet designs. The MLI-84 is a BMP-1 that is slightly longer and has a rear-mounted Dushka 12.7mm heavy machine gun. I don't think the 12.7mm Dushka can be fired from under the armor or when the crew is dismounting, but it's certainly a neat idea. Otherwise, it's a standard BMP-1, but slightly heavier, and so a little worse at swimming. The BMP-1, way back in the prototype phase, had initially been pitched with an autocannon, but Nikita Khrushchev's insatiable lust for all things nuclear, rocket-propelled, and corn-related, though one of those might be less relevant than the rest, was a driving factor in the decision to mount the ultimately unsatisfactory 73mm rocket-assisted smoothbore gun. The new generation of BMP, which the Soviets creatively named BMP-2, would represent a substantial product improvement package for the BMP concept, improving the flaws in BMP-1 while keeping what strengths the Soviets saw in the design. Prototyping began in the early 1970s, with production delayed until 1980, due to some magical Soviet bureaucratic shenanigans that my Western brain can barely comprehend. By 1989, some 14,000 BMP-2 had been produced and were in service across the Warsaw Pact. Entering service around 1980, the initial BMP-2 is a full-tracked amphibious infantry fighting vehicle mounting a stabilized 30mm automatic cannon, coaxial Kalashnikov machine gun, and an AT-4, AT-5 spigot spandrel universal launcher with a spare dismountable tripod. The 30mm cannon has a low and high fire rate and 500 total rounds of dual-fed armor-piercing and high explosive. Like the BMP-1, it carries two crew, a driver, mechanic, and gunner, and seven dismounts, including the commander. The commander's position is moved from the hull to the turret. The bow was lengthened beyond that of the long-nosed BMP-1, which improves ingress-egress from steep banks and waterborne handling at the expense of driver visibility. The Soviets felt that nautical adventures were such an important part of their military tactics that they were willing to accept worsening the driver's view markedly in exchange for improving this waterborne handling. While the BMP-2 represents an overall major improvement, the 30mm cannon does have issues regarding the gas venting into the fighting compartment. To ameliorate this, a exhaust fan system is introduced. However, even with that, on the high fire rate, the hatches should be open to fire the cannon. The hatch arrangements are, as on the BMP-1, save the repositioned commander and a two-hatch, two-man turret. Armor and propulsion is effectively the same as BMP-1. BMP-2 can best be distinguished from BMP-1 by the hard-mounted ATGM launcher center on the turret, the wider two-man turret, and the long, skinny 30mm cannon. Note as well that the 30mm cannon can elevate up to 85 degrees, a boon for those operating in heavily vertical environments. As with BMP-1D, Soviet forces in Afghanistan desired an up-armor kit for the BMP-2 to protect against close-range ambushes by the Mujahideen, firing 50 caliber or 14.5mm armor-piercing from machine guns into the hull sides of vehicles. Like the BMP-1D, this adds armor skirts to the sides and rear while retaining the missile launcher. The concept is similar to the Nazi bazooka plates because the threat was the same. 12.7x108 and 14.5x114 armor-piercing fire against the thin side armor. Like the BMP-1K, the BMP-2K has an extra antenna, though they're now mounted to the turret as on the standard BMP-2. There was no command and staff version of the BMP-2 made, BMP-1 command and staff soldiered on. The final BMP-2 variant we'll discuss right now is the BMO-1, a flamethrower troops fighting vehicle. This is a modified BMP-2 that removes the ATGM and reduces the number of dismounts to four in exchange for 22 RPO series thermobaric incendiary or smoke grenade launchers, as well as two square mounts for smoke or incendiary grenade launchers on the turret front. While this is capable of bringing serious volumes of hate to the battlefield, it is also a thinly armored rolling bomb, so remember PSC Snuffy, stand back before you shoot it up with that law. Though the BMP-2 was only in combat service starting in 1979 to 1980, its service in Afghanistan as well as exercises was showing weaknesses to the design, mainly due to the relatively small and old chassis it inherited from BMP-1. By 1985, prototypes were in testing of a new generation BMP that would become, again, the imaginatively named BMP-3. This had the chassis developed by Kurgan Zavod and the armament system by a team led by Arkady Shapunov of the KBP Design Bureau. Between 1988 and 1991, a staggering 250 vehicles were produced. 
though currently over 2,000 have been made, and about 600 to 750 are in service with the Russian Federation. NATO designated the vehicle BMP M1990-1. The BMP-3 is an amphibious, fully track-laying infantry fighting vehicle armed with a 100mm low-pressure rifled gun launcher, a 30mm autocannon, and three 7.62mm Kalashnikov machine guns, one coaxial and two in the sponsons. Whereas the BMP-1 had been designed for the relatively space-efficient Soviet conscript who grew up during the, let's say, calorically restricted years of the 1950s, 40s, and 30s, the BMP-3 had to deal with the children of mature socialism who were, if not else statistically taller. The vehicle would fit seven of these taller conscripts in a surprisingly spacious arrangement with an Under Armour toilet and twice as much internal volume per passenger as previous Soviet BMPs. Such bourgeois decadence wouldn't have been allowed under the old <laughs> The unorthodox rear door arrangement is less than ideal, but still provides protection to sides and rear when disembarking over the raised engine deck. Later modifications have removed this by switching the engine to the front. The 100mm cannon fires the same HE frag shells as the D-10 series and fits the 9K116-3 missile complex with the same 9M117 Bazina or Fable NATO AT-12 Swinger gun-launched anti-tank missile as the D-10 series, albeit the shells are fired at a lower velocity due to smaller case size. This provides excellent high-explosive firepower, but poor anti-tank capability against contemporary NATO threats in the frontal arc. In terms of protection, BMP-3 compares well with contemporaries, with slightly better frontal and slightly worse side armor than the M2A2 Bradley on introduction. It is still vulnerable, though, to light anti-tank weapons and large blast mines, as service in unconventional conflicts has shown. The BMP-3 is amphibious, and a dedicated navalized version for amphibious forces has been produced. This is distinguished by the very large rear-mounted snorkel. Further modifications and use of the chassis will be discussed in Appendix 1, What Happened and Next, covering post-Soviet perspective and fielded developments. Ever since the Soviet Union invented paratroops in 1930, the Soviets have been mildly obsessed with the concept. Understandably so. Since the 1930s, their warfighting concepts have consistently revolved around simultaneously bringing under attack the whole of an enemy force through the tactical depth of its defense. Unfortunately for the Soviet airborne arm, the Vozdushno Desantnoye Voska, or VDV, the initial enthusiasm gave way to a series of impressive misfires during the Great Patriotic War. Two notable misadventures included jumping over 7,000 Desantniki, paratroopers into a hot DZ to support Colonel General Bulov's five-month cavalry raid in 1941 without sufficient anti-tank means or fighter cover, resulting in the commander of the force being killed, and jumping three full airborne brigades, over 4,000 men, onto the lead elements of a German panzer division which had four more divisions following it in the 1943 Dnieper airborne operation, at which point Stalin, in one of the few humanitarian actions he ever made, banned further large-scale airborne jumps. Skipping ahead to the 1960s, just as the motor rifles needed to be swaddled in the protective systems of a BTR or BMP on the modern nuclear battlefield, Soviet planners concluded that the BDV needed something more than soft-skinned jeeps and trucks. Thus, the BMD, or Boyevaya Machina de Santa, literally airborne fighting vehicle, was developed. Airborne here meaning paratrooper. The first BMD entered service in 1968 as the BMD. We're going to call it the BMD-1 for convenience because there's others. The BMD is a full-tracked, very lightly armored, airborne amphibious infantry fighting vehicle mounting the same turret as BMP-1. By the end of production in 1987, nearly 4,000 had been produced. The crew consisted of a driver, front and center, and a gunner in the turret. Dismounts were arrayed three in the back and one each flanking the driver in the bow with a machine gun to play with. The main hatch is a large swing-up hatch in the center rear, and the starboard bow gunner was the vehicle commander. The armor is enough to defend against small arms, but it's really not designed to take a beating. It is rated to stop caliber 50 armor piercing from the frontal 70 degree arc and all around protection from caliber 30 rifles firing ball. For nautical adventures, it is equipped with a trim vane on the bow and two water jets at the stern. If by now you haven't noticed the pattern, the K variants have an extra antenna or two. Not much to say though, the BMD-1K is a BMD-1 with two antennas and it's a company and battalion command vehicle. So the BMD-1 has the same turret as the BMP-1, which meant that when they did the BMP-1P upgrade, they could go and apply that to the BMD-1 as well. This was the BMD-1P, or BMD-1PK for the command variants, and fitted the 9K111 Russian word with unfortunate English homophone that I can't say on YouTube that means bassoon, 
anti-tank missile complex. By the early 1980s, between exercises and combat in Afghanistan, the limitations of BMD-1 were becoming apparent. To ameliorate them, a new turret was developed for the chassis, and some minor modifications were made. The result was BMD-2, again, an imaginative name from the Soviets. This is a full-tracked amphibious airborne infantry fighting vehicle armed with a stabilized 30mm cannon, two 7.62mm Kalashnikov machine guns, one coaxial and one in the port bow, and the universal AT-4 Spigot AT-5 Spandrel Pintle Launcher. Just under 2,000 were produced from 1985 to 1991. The hull of the vehicle is broadly identical to the BMD-1, and the vehicle is slightly heavier without a compensating increase in buoyancy, so it gets a little sportier when it swims, but they still swim them often enough, so it's not dangerous. The BMD-2 was also made in the BMD-2K. It's a command variant. It has an extra antenna. It's hard to find pictures of. The Soviets enjoyed the BMD-2, but they never seemed to make enough of them to fully replace the BMD-1. In the 1980s, as well as the BMP-3 design studies, the Soviets conducted a number of design studies to see if they could figure out a way to jam the 100mm, 30mm gun turret onto a BMD. The results were that they couldn't, it would either weigh too much and so they could only fit one in each airplane, or they wouldn't be able to do it at all. And so they developed the BMD-3. The BMD-3 introduced a larger and heavier hull mounting a standard BMP-2 turret. Mass production began in 1991 with a staggering 36 produced by the fall of the USSR. In total, a blistering 143 BMD-3s were produced, and the VDV continues to use the BMD-1 and 2 alongside the new BMD-4, which squared the circle and put the 100mm and 30mm combined gun turret onto a BMD. The BMD-3 is mainly distinguished by the lack of a pike nose like the BMD-1 and 2, the stubbier nose than the BMP-2, and the lack of a 100mm gun, meaning that it's not a BMD-4. Aquatic motive power is through two water jets mounted to the rear, and there is a bow trim vane. So, by the early 1970s, the VDV, they had their airborne BMPs, the BMD, they had their airborne MTLBs, the GTMU, but they didn't have an airborne BTR. The BTRD was their solution to this problem. Introduced in 1974, it is an all-tracked, amphibious, lightly armored airborne personnel carrier. It looks quite similar to a BMD-1 without a turret, and while it's not quite as simple as that, it really isn't meaningfully different than that either. The crew consists of a driver, two bow gunners, and up to 10 dismounts. Egress is through a back hatch over the engine deck like the BMD-1, and like the BMD-1, it can swim. The BTRD was also, somewhat confusingly, made into the BMD-1 KSH, Command and Staff. The BMD-1 KSH is a BTRD with a bed frame antenna and two big antenna masts on top of it. Otherwise, it is very similar to the BTRD. The next BTRD variant is designed for that wide swath of people who just really love directing artillery fire, the sound of the guns, but they also really want to fling themselves out of the back of a plane in a tin can with a rocket parachute because otherwise you'll go splat. But they also just really hate guns. The vehicle for them is the 1V119. It's a BTRD with no guns and a suite of sensors to direct artillery fire. Importantly, it looks like a BMD-1 with a big turret and a tall mic surveillance radar. It entered service in 1982 alongside the 2S9 120mm gun mortar, the Nona. Finally, we have the Brem-D. The Brem-D is an amphibious airborne armored recovery vehicle. You can tell because it looks distinctly like a BMD that traded its turret for a crane. It entered service in the 1980s and isn't exceedingly common, as you can imagine, there aren't that many sorts of mechanics who would crew an armored recovery vehicle that also desire to be thrown out of a plane behind enemy lines. Moving quickly away from the monotony of Soviet vehicle naming characteristics, we come to the Czechoslovakians. In the late 1950s, Czechoslovakia was looking to replace the OT-810 series of half-tracks, which they had been using and were totally not copies of the Nazi Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251 with a different engine and a roof attached. The replacement vehicle, the OT-64 Scott, was a wheeled amphibious armored personnel carrier. It would be jointly produced in Poland and Czechoslovakia between 1963 and 1971, with just over 4,500 examples made. Information on the OT-64 is somewhat thin on the ground, especially on the several different turrets that it was equipped with, but it's broadly comparable to a BTR with a back door. The first OT-64 variant was a pure APC with a pintle-mounted PK or UK-59 or Dushka heavy machine gun and potentially up to 18 dismounts, apparently. 
When mounting a turret, the number of dismounts was, in theory, lowered to 10. Starting shortly after production began, the OT-64 was modified to mount the turret off the FUG series of reconnaissance cars and armored personnel carriers, with a 14.5mm and 7.62mm machine gun with low angles of fire. The OT-64, or SCOT, was also produced at some point in its production with the BTR-BRDM turret, mainly the older low-angle-of-fire model, because they developed their own high-angle-of-fire model. Before we describe that, we also have the BRDM turret OT-64 that the Poles had, where they just welded two Sager ATGMs to the side of the turrets. The OT-64 was later produced with a high-angle-of-fire turret, still mounting the 14.5 and coaxial 7.62 machine gun, there were also a number of OT-64 command variants, most distinguished by the large antennas sprouting off the roof. I wish I had better information on these, but I don't, because apparently no one cared to write it down and put it somewhere where I can find it in a language I can understand. Continuing our tour of the Warsaw Pact, the Fug series was a Hungarian vehicle family that started with a not-BRDM and expanded to include an armored personnel carrier. The Fug is a 4x4 amphibious vehicle with four auxiliary belly wheels, it's propelled when swimming by two water jets and is armored against small arms fire, having a crew of two to three depending if there's a gunner accompanying the driver and commander, with four to six dismounts who exit through the side doors. The initial FUG was a scout car that had no turret, The later Czechoslovakian versions were equipped with the 7.62mm gun turret from the OT-62B Topas. The Hungarians wanted an armored personnel carrier to go along with their scout car, so they stretched the hull a little bit and removed the auxiliary wheels, stuck a BRDM turret onto it, and hey presto, homegrown armored personnel carrier. Going back to the scout car for a second, the Czechoslovakians wanted more bang for their buck on their scout cars, so they stuck an 82mm recoilless rifle on the side of the turrets of some of their OT-65 slash FUG series scout cars. Command variants were also produced, and like most, if not all of the command variants, they were the standard vehicle with another radio. Shifting away from the Czechoslovakian and Hungarian vehicles, we come back to the Soviets for airborne fire support vehicles. So after the VDV lost a few thousand paratroopers jumping in front of panzer divisions, the Soviets came away from World War II with an abiding desire for the airborne to kill the heck out of tanks. This resulted in two vehicles I'll be discussing here, and a few we'll discuss later in the anti-tank section. The first vehicle is the ASU-57, which stemmed from wartime efforts to jam a gun that would kill tanks onto something small enough to fit in a plane and light enough to survive being thrown out the back. The result entered service in 1951 and was the ASU-57, named for the caliber of its gun. It is a full-tracked, open-topped casemate tank destroyer slash assault gun with hopes and dreams for armor, a very powerful 57mm gun, and a tendency to have nearly a dozen descent and key clown carring on top of it. The gun is potent for 1951, but would struggle against even mid-1950s NATO heavy armor. That said, it shouldn't be trifled with. The ASU-57 is comically small, easy to hide, and the gun will still kill light vehicles and can penetrate the sides of medium, heavy, and main battle tanks. The ASU-57 KSHM is the only major produced variant of the ASU-57. It is an ASU-57 with the 57mm gun replaced by a light machine gun, though that begs the question of why it's still the ASU-57. If the 57 is for the caliber of the gun, shouldn't this be the ASU-7.62? Anyway, it has an extra antennas fitted to it and a big machine gun pintle on the roof. By the 1960s, the Soviets had come to the understanding that an open-topped vehicle with basically no armor was somewhat incompatible with the modern nuclear battlefield. The ASU-85 was developed as a result, and it is a fully-tracked, closed-top, casemate airborne self-propelled anti-tank and assault gun mounting a high-velocity 85mm cannon, which is not related to the gun in the T-3485. It's a derivative of the D-44 and D-48 anti-tank guns. The ASU-85 is based on the PT-76 chassis, and over 500 were produced between 1959 and 1966. It was exported to Vietnam, the German Democratic Republic, that's East Germany for those of you playing along at home, as well as Poland. The ASU-85 is vaguely armored, but being airborne and derived from a light tank, the armor is vulnerable to light anti-tank rockets. The armor is mainly there for protection against small arms and shell splinters. The gun was reasonably effective at the time, but quickly became less capable of handling NATO threats. Production was curtailed in the mid-1960s as the BMD series was stood up, promising similar anti-tank firepower in a smaller, more multi-role package. From airborne self-propelled anti-tank guns, let's move on to the scout and reconnaissance vehicles. 
These vehicles, especially the BRDM series, are very common chassis for other systems, with a multitude of missiles fitted to various derivatives. Those will be covered in the relevant video detailing anti-tank and anti-aircraft systems later. With that administ trivia out of the way, we'll move to the BRDM-1. The BRDM-1 was a replacement for the BTR-40 in the scout role, and indeed is a BTR-40 that can swim. It is a wheeled amphibious scout car, initially with an open top, though very quickly produced with a roof. Around 10,000 were produced from 1957 to 66, and a 1958 saw production switch to a roofed model. The roofed version accounts for almost all vehicles documented. It has two top hatches and a set of double doors at the back, and the running gear is modified from a BTR-40, with the addition of two auxiliary wheels to prevent the vehicle from high centering and a water jet for swimming. A Goryunov machine gun was mounted on a Pintle center front and three scouts could be carried. From 1966, the BRDM RKH was introduced. This is a chemical reconnaissance version of the BRDM-1 with a closed roof and a number of marker flags at the rear. It is also fitted with a gaggle of sensors internally to detect if the air is full of lung hurting juice or bone hurting rays. Despite the closed roof, it's notable that the crew of the chemical radiological reconnaissance vehicles typically in videos are seen still wearing their protective gear from inside the vehicles. The BRDM was pretty good at its job, but Soviet planners felt it was a little underarmed for the 1960s battlefield and had kind of bad forward visibility due to the big duckbill bow for swimming. To ameliorate this, they designed the BRDM-2. Starting production in 1965, the BRDM-2 is a wheeled 4x4 amphibious scout car with a fully enclosed roof and fitted with a turret for the 14.5mm KPVT and coaxial 7.62mm PKT machine gun. The turret is shared with the BTR-60PB, and crew consists of a commander and driver at the front, with a gunner and fourth crew member in the vehicle center. Armor is more aspiration than reality, but it should stop small arms fire and probably caliber 50 frontally at extended ranges. The BRDM-2 was also produced as a nuclear biological chemical reconnaissance vehicle, and this is a BRDM-2 without the gun and with a lot of chemical and radiological reconnaissance equipment stuffed inside. If these are driving around, you're probably going to have a bad day choking on your lungs or maybe some FLKs down the line if you survive, but you know, that's certainly not boring. The two biggest giveaways are the lack of a gun in the turret and the lane marker flag dropping apparatus at the rear of the vehicle, though another hint might be the seizing from nerve agent poisoning or vomiting from acute radiation sickness. The BRDM-2 was also produced as a command variant. It lacks the turret and has some more aerials and was used as a reconnaissance battalion command vehicle. This isn't really too big of a fish to fry, but you know, it's not slim pickings either, so keep an eye on it. By the mid to late 1980s and early 1990s, the Soviets and then Russians were somewhat dissatisfied with the BRDM-2's performance and so sought to introduce the BRDM-3. This is a reconnaissance vehicle based on the BTR-80 AK, which has the 30mm gun turret and dual whip antennas, as well as improved optical systems. It supports a crew of six, a driver, a commander, a gunner, and three scouts. With the introduction of the BTR-80, the Soviets felt that this would make a pretty darn good chemical and radiological reconnaissance vehicle compared to the aging BRDM-2 RKHB, so they fitted a standard BTR-80 out as a chemical reconnaissance vehicle. The biggest improvement over the BRDM is that it keeps the gun and is on a nicer chassis. The telltale giveaway is again the lane marker flag apparatus mounted to the rear of the vehicle, as well as the blistering from mustard gas or the hair falling out and random lesions from acute radiation sickness. The Soviets liked the BRDM series, but they wanted something a little zippier and higher tech than that in the PT-76, so in 1973 they introduced a modified BMP-1 for the reconnaissance role. It was fitted with a wider two-man turret without a missile launcher or autoloader, but it fits the tall Mike battlefield surveillance radar. The big distinguishing feature is that the turret is farther back and the radar sticks out of the roof sometimes. There's also a command variant of the BRM-1, the BRM-1K, that has a slightly different electronics fitment, but other than that looks borderline identical. As I mentioned in the previous video, the Soviet army is really an artillery army, and to support the artillery, they had a number of artillery reconnaissance vehicles. The first we'll discuss is the PRP-3. The PRP-3 is a Soviet artillery reconnaissance vehicle based on the BMP-1. The turret has been modified to fit only a single Kalashnikov machine gun, but also it has a large doghouse on the starboard side of the turret for a night vision system, the small FRED radar in the turret, and it has a mortar for firing illumination shells. This was introduced in 1972 and has a crew of five. Its replacement was the PRP-4. 
It removed the flare launching mortar from the rear of the vehicle and added two large dog houses to the sides of the larger two-man turret. It also has the tall Mike radar instead of the small Fred radar. In 1988, the PRP-4M was introduced with an added thermal imager. Following the trend of radar vehicles, we have the 1RL232 Big Fred counter-battery radar. This is an MTLB with a big counter-battery radar on top. Over 700 have been produced starting in 1970. Its NATO codename, as mentioned, is Big Fred. Another firefinding or counter-battery radar is the 1RL239. This is the NATO codename Rice Bag. It has an H-band firefinder radar on an MTLBU chassis. It is a big circular dish, and again, the NATO codename is Rice Bag. The final two vehicles we'll be discussing are BMP derivatives. First, perhaps my favorite BMP derivative, the IPR. The IPR riverbed reconnaissance vehicle is distinguished by the large snorkel mast the two rear propellers and looking nothing like a BMP-1, and you might be wondering what this is. Well, if you were listening closely, you heard me say snorkel mast, and you heard that right. This is a BMP submarine. It was designed to reconnoiter the beds of rivers for crossings, and was fitted with sonar, ballast tanks, and a single PK machine gun. It even has an airlock or diver lockout chamber so that the single diver in the crew can go out to defuse mines while underwater, and that's right, it can detect mines underwater. The IPR was again designed to reconnoiter the riverbed of potential crossing locations with a crew of three, commander, driver, mechanic, and diver. Serial production began in 1973, and a small number were produced before advancements in sonar technology meant that it wasn't necessary for the vehicle to be a submarine, resulting in the similar but simplified IRM Zhuk, or Beetle. The IRM Zhuk, or Beetle, is a BMP-based engineering reconnaissance vehicle. It is designed to support combat engineers, and it is able to swim, carries six sappers, and has mine clearance equipment, mine detectors, and a crew of three, driver, mechanic, commander, and gunner radio operator, who has a little PKT turret to play with for self-defense. It is amphibious if the large propellers at the rear and being derived from a submarine didn't give it away, and is equipped with a fancy sonar. Around 80 machines were produced by the fall of the Soviet Union, and they appear to still be in some limited service. This concludes our examination of the weird and wonderful myriad, menagerie, and panoply of Soviet vehicles that are designed to carry people and things around under armor on the battlefield. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, and tune in next time to enjoy Part 3, Anti-Tank and Anti-Aircraft Systems, where I go insane trying to remember NATO codenames, before Part 4, Rocket Troops and Artillery, where I go insane trying to figure out how many different artillery pieces the Soviets used. Thank you, and have a nice day.